It's like the Republicans, it's the power part is to me about taking up this issue as a tribal issue without really understanding it because you don't care what happens to women. You don't care how their health care is impacted. For you, it's just a way to get elected and demagogue. Hello, everyone. This is JVL here with my best friend, Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark. Super great show today. We're going to talk about abortion and O.J. Simpson. What could be better? Uh, so our friend, friend, friend of the bulwark, David French has a, I don't, I don't know if it's a piece in the New York times or his newsletter from the New York. It's very hard. The, the problem is the New York times made a huge mistake hiring David French because he could write the entire paper every day if they let him. So David has a piece up about the pro-life movement and what has happened to the pro-life movement in, under Trump. And it is very interesting. It dovetails with uh, a great deal of, of my thinking. And I'm interested in how it intersects with yours. What, what David essentially says is, I've been a pro-lifer my entire adult life. And uh, I have all sorts of pro-choice friends who had said to me, you don't understand. This is the pro-life movement only cares about controlling women. Uh, n none of this stuff is about personhood or human dignity or what. And Dave was like, no, no, you don't understand. It's really about life. And, uh, and now he's, he's saying, crap, maybe, maybe it was actually about that stuff all, all along. Um, because of the actions of the pro-life movement since Dobbs, because the, the pro-life movement, response to Dobbs was not to pass a whole bunch of social safety net spending to make life easier on women and stuff like that. It was to do things like criminalize driving through your county to, on your way to an abortion, as uh, a few Texas counties have done. Um, and uh, or <laughs> you know, the Alabama Supreme Court trying to criminalize IVF. That's That has been the pro-life movement's response. And it's uh, it's something I've been thinking about a lot too, and I I just thought it would be interesting for us to talk about it. What are your thoughts, Sarah? Uh, I'm much more interested in your thoughts on this than mine. Um, we have talked about abortion in the past, and I'll just say, like as a in terms of who I am on this issue, uh, I always considered myself, especially when I was younger, pro life, uh, and as I got older. Uh, I increasingly became much squishier. And the second you become squishy on it, you become sort of pro-choice. Um, even though um, that's not, I wouldn't sort of have defined myself, especially as a young conservative, let's say in my 20s. Uh, but one of the things that that struck me, and like now, actually after having had kids, I am more pro-choice uh, than I was before. Um, in large part, just because you see how complicated all of it is and how important it is that the relationship really be, be between a woman and her doctor uh, or parents and the doctor. Uh, and they are making choices that are deeply hard uh, in many of these cases and that impact uh, uh, the mother's health. Um, and I just, uh, I, I, I do get now very frustrated with seeing like a bunch of men on TV being like, well, this is how this should go, you know? Uh, and I think especially like there's been some of these back and forths in Congress where you, you can see that the men who are talking about this, who are making laws about it, literally have no idea how a women's reproductive system works. And so um, I am at the zenith of my pro-choiceness at this point. Um, but I'll say about the David piece, one of the things that resonated with me was the fact that he was talking about how he knew all of these uh, pro-life advocates who were incredibly good faith in their advocacy. And they were consistent in terms of if you believe that um, life is life and life begins at conception, then that carries through to a frozen embryo. Right. That 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 that's just the logical extension of having principles and that he was surrounded by people with principles that to me resonated for me as a sort of like 
uh, I used to really defend the Republican Party against charges of racism, Mm -hmm. you know, because I didn't know any racist Republicans. Uh, right. Like the people that I knew <laughs> you didn't who realize were, that you knew any racist Republicans were or whatever. <laughs> yeah, say, say. But it, it, it's the difference between, um, you know, when you're like, oh, well, I, I know this, like hmm, this group of people and they are this way. And I presume the entire party and or the entire, you know, conservative apparatus is the way this way. And that is wrong often because what happens is these become divorced from the advocacy side and the people who are deeply committed to it, it just becomes another tribal pose, right? Just like another thing that you do where it's like, I'm on this team and this is what this team believes. Um, like for me, I remember all my me- friends at AEI I believe in small government. So yeah. conservatives must really believe in small government too. That's right. Right. Um, and, and the thing that David points out where it's sort of like when the rubber meets the road on the politics of it, you see where people's like genuine principles are. And his point that Trump has no principles, which we knew, but also that the entire movement uh, was willing to trade those principles for power. And it's just it's like every other issue. Right. It's 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 not uh, it's not singular to the pro-life movement. It's just what the Republican Party did in general on uh, debts and deficit on foreign uh, policy. Foreign policy, right? Uh, even on like entitlement states, like it is very unpopular to say you're going to do something about Medicare and Social Security, and as a result, Republicans are now running from doing something Free about trade. Medicare. And, yeah, all of it. Um, and so, yeah, it was through that lens that I I thought David's piece. I mean, David's. We should have a David's always right. I mean, David writes very few things that I disagree with. Even though I would say I disagree with David to some degree on the merits of this, but mo- this is why I was mostly interested in your take. Because you have talked a lot on this podcast and in general about this hypocrisy that you've seen out of the pro-life movement. And I think people maybe don't even understand. Like, they're always like, you, when they say we have Trump derangement syndrome, what they don't understand about why we're so torqued up is, A, because of the threat that we see, but also because we were of this world and so the betrayal feels to watch everybody be like, oh, no, I had no principles. Oh, no, I didn't care. I felt this way on the gay stuff, uh, you know, where it was like I get, took people in good faith uh, about how <laughs> how they uh, they believed in, in marriage and whatever, and only to have it turn out that they wanted just me not to have a family. But if Donald Trump gets to have three wives, cool, no big. Right. He wants to pay for abortions. He wants to, you know, pal around with Matt Gates, who sleeps with 17 year old. Like there is no sense of sexual morality that these people have, despite the fact that they've tried to foist it on the rest of us for a long time. That is very. It's purely about power. It, right. But, but I sorry, mean, they would be I happy what to you believe. Do you agree with David on the merits that all life begins at conception? Yeah. Yeah. This is. You know, this is why, you know, abortion was always one part of it, right? There's there's the there's the death penalty stuff. There's the just war stuff. There's the, you know, the Catholic social doctrine about how you got to, you know, you know, you know, who's you know, who's very vulnerable in, in a capitalist society, children and pregnant women. Right, incredibly vulnerable to the system around them, and the system has a, a duty to protect them and help them and keep them from being victimized by like the big maw of capitalism, which only sees people's worth as workers. Um, workers, of the world unite. You like how commie I'm getting here. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, but this, as you say, the the story of the pro life movement is exact exactly the same. It's just the same story as the conservative movement and the same story as the Republican Party over the last seven years. There's no difference at all, right? It is a bunch of people being asked to be being said, uh, we'll give you power so long as you go along with this. And I'm saying, great. Yes, that's all I want is power. And uh, what that power is to be used for is then negotiable. It's it's totally divorced from the ideological underpinnings, though, of the movement. And uh, that's what makes it authoritarian, right? When when your pursuit of power is wedded to the pursuit of power and not to an ideological project, and that's that's where you get authoritarianism. And that's what this looks like to me. And 
again, you see it in the COVID stuff. You see it, the response of Republicans to COVID, the the response of Republicans to the child tax credit that was in the American Rescue Plan and their attempts to kill it. You know, Biden has unbelievably masterfully resurrected a light version of the child tax credit. He got it past the House, which was amazing. And Republicans in the Senate are trying to kill it. I just, I, I you know, <laughs> like it is, it is impossible. I, and, and I think I mean that. I just, well, it seems to me to be impossible to take the at face value the pro life incorporated or Republican argument that they care so much about life when they have so little interest in helping families. Yeah. Uh, I, I just I don't understand it. Um and I don't think it can be understood because I think it really is all about controlling women, right? I mean you could you could draft the policy responses to a post Dobbs world if the pro life movement had meant what it said. Right? You would have had very careful legislation with you know, it would have taken a long time for the legislation to pass because even in red states, because it would have been very carefully uh, constructed with, you know, deep understandings about uh, the differences between like elective abortions and DNC procedures resulting from miscarriages. Right. You would have seen all sorts of stuff. Instead, it was people rushing out of the gate to just pass just, you know, early as possible. Early as possible. Can we get to six weeks? With zero regard for anything else and with no no protections for mothers, no help for, for people. And this is, you know, pro-lifers don't want to hear this. The number of abortions in America has gone up for the first time in like 30 years. Yeah. And I, you know, this is why I was always dubious of the idea that like you have to – if if you really care about abortion, then you have to vote for Republicans because the truth is the number of abortions has been receding since the eighties, under uh, I'm sorry since the nine since the nineties under both Democratic and Republican presidents, and if you just plot the line graph, the rate of recession on the abortions uh, is a little bit faster under Democrats. I don't think that's I think that's tied to economics and not to you know policies, but whatever. Um, and, and now we have more abortions. And nobody cares, right? Nobody in the pro-life side cares about this. They think it's all great. Hey, Sarah, there's there's more show. Oh, there is? Yeah. Are we still talking? We have more yeah, talking? We're still, we're still talking. The, the talking goes on. But that's only for the, you know, the, the people who are inside the Velvet Rope, the, the Bulwark Plus members. Oh, they got to subscribe. Yeah. Tell them to subscribe. Tell the you people, You should subscribe. Sarah. Guys, why wouldn't you subscribe? You get all kinds of things. You get some some extra uh, me and JVL. You get some extra me and George Conway. Do you get? Oh, you get JVL's triad. It's one of the best things the Bulwark offers. I read it at least once or twice a week. <laughs> yes. Go and subscribe. We'd love to have you.